The Lord be with you. I've appreciated the Council of King of Glory Lutheran Church taking time at each council meeting since August to look at why it is that God brought us here. You know, churches exist for a reason, and hopefully we all agree that we're here to make disciples of Jesus. Hopefully we all agree that the Bible is the word of God, and it's to be our guidepost, and we hopefully agree that the Holy Spirit is to lead us. And that's a, a, a tough process to try to figure out, because we've got 60, 70 people who are all here for different purposes and different reasons, and we show up for worship on Sunday, but why are we here? Why has God gathered us together? Uh, why is that? Uh, and different people have different ideas of why we're here. And so I've been trying to lead the council, the leadership of the church, in a discovery process that says, what is it about us that God has shaped us to be the people we are? What is it that drives us? And then what is it in our community around us that God has uniquely called, that there are people that God has uniquely called us to reach out to and to bring them into the kingdom of God? How do we discover that process? And it's this chaotic process where it just seems like we're all over the place and you know things don't seem to be coming together. Uh, and so what am I doing here? And that's a good question. So I'm going to be discussing why it is that I accepted the call to be the pastor of King of Glory Lutheran Church, because this was not an easy decision for me. Uh, so uh, let me discuss the, the first part. Uh, I, I think this is an important part of doing this, and I hope I don't sound like I'm complaining, and I'm really leery about putting this up on YouTube, you know, for anyone to kind of stumble across, because like I said, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining, but I think it's important for you to understand as the leadership and as the people of King of Glory, you know, why I'm here and then, you know, why I'm not here. So let me start with the I hope I'm not complaining part. <laughs> okay, so uh, to start off with, uh, I was in a really good place back in Paso Robles, California. Uh, I, I had experienced the, the last year and a half of ministry there was the best ministry of my life. I had support. I had Bible studies. I had a routine that I very much enjoyed. Uh, you know, we were going through a, kind of this same process of self-discovery where, you know, I said to the leadership, hey, if you want to go through this process, I'd be happy to provide, you know, resources and material and ask questions and, you know, kind of go, go through this process. And I was in a good place. Uh, and so it was hard to say no to where, oh, it was just a really good thing. And on top of that, in taking the call here, I took a $20,000 a year pay cut. Now, I don't know what that's like for you. For me, that's kind of difficult, uh, you know, especially since my previous congregation, every year they you gave me a cost of living increase and it was comfortable making that much money. And coming here, it's been a struggle. Uh, you know, things like you know, I have 20 year old cars, which is fine, uh, but eventually they're going to need to be replaced. Uh, you know, during the winter, it got cold. And so we keep our thermostat set at 52 degrees during the winter. And we can we can handle that. Uh, we stopped going out to eat something that we were able to enjoy doing and we enjoyed going out to eat. And now we can't afford it. And that's fine. I can give up that. Uh, we don't have enough money now to invest for retirement out of my salary. Uh, we don't have enough money to invest for emergencies. Uh, and I suppose we will survive that process. Uh, point being is I did not come here to improve my standard of living. Uh, whatever, whatever you've been told as far as the cost of living goes, maybe if you bought your house 20 years ago, this was an affordable place to live but I paid half a million dollars for my house and it's not as nice as my previous houses. Yes. And that's okay. I'm grateful to have a roof over my head. It was a nightmare, a nightmare just trying to find any place to rent or to buy. Uh, there was so much competition, so little available. And I hate moving. I hate, hate, 
hate moving. It is so stressful and it is so expensive to move. So I did not come here because my standard of living would increase. No, my standard of living has gone down. Uh, I did not come here uh, because, well, Paso Robles was a very nice place to live. And this is a nice place to live. So there's no improvements that I see as far as my quality of life going up. So just saying, there was a sacrifice involved in accepting the call here. It was not something where, where I could say, well, at least my quality of life will go up. No, that has not been the case. So thought I needed to say that. All right, so now let me go through my history of my, my uh, three churches that I have served and why it is that I think God led me to King of Glory Lutheran Church. All right, my first call out of the seminary, I was 26 years old and it was to Stockton, California. Uh, each of my churches have all been approximately the same size, you know, about the same number of people, same number of people in worship. Maybe my last congregation was a little bit larger in size. Uh, and if you count the school, way, way bigger. Uh, so my first call was to a church in Stockton, California. Uh, and it was a good church. It was a good experience, especially since I was a snot-nosed brat. I was way too young and way too inexperienced to be a pastor. And those people were just, they were very kind to me. Yes. But I came all on fire to teach the word of God, preach the word of God, lead worship. And I truly believed, I truly believed coming out of seminary at age 26, that if I got up there on Sunday morning and I led Bible study and I led our Lutheran liturgy the way it was supposed to be led, I administered the sacraments according to the the institution of Jesus Christ, if I preach the gospel in all of its truth and purity, uh, preach law gospel sermons, that people would just go and be as excited as I was to proclaim the gospel, and they would go and talk to their friends and neighbors and families and friends and lead them to Christ, and the church would be self-sustaining and uh, grow in some way or shape and form, you know, spiritually and, uh, you know, at least maintain numbers. I just thought God would take care of things if I did what I was supposed to on Sunday mornings. Well, things did not turn out so nice and neat, which led me to think, okay, maybe I'm not preaching the word according to its truth and purity. Uh, maybe I'm not administering the sacraments correctly. Maybe I'm not leading Bible study correctly. Uh, or maybe the problem is with the people. Maybe they're just not hearing what I'm saying, and so we're just kind of in a holding pattern, you know, and slowly dying and not able to pay the bills. So my second congregation, uh, this was, uh, I was at my first congregation three and a half years, and then uh, my second congregation was up the road a ways up in Lodi, California. Again, another small congregation. And, and so I served them for three years, and I was there for a couple of years before I realized, wow, you know, these are good people. You know, people were going to Bible studies, they were meeting in small groups, uh, and, but after a while, I realized, I'm not cut out for this, you know, I need partners in the gospel. I need people who are willing to go and speak the gospel to other people who are willing to say, hey, how do we do this gospel thing together? And I thought, okay, maybe what I need, because again, I was still snot-nosed, still young, still inexperienced. You know, what was I in my early 30s at the time? you know, I'd never had a real job, you know, nine to five, where I actually had to go out there and, you know, make a living and uh, live out in the rat race, never had that. So I thought, okay, what I need is partnership in the gospel. Maybe if I go and be an associate pastor, I have an experienced, wise, learned, experienced senior pastor, and they've got a staff. And I would work together with that staff and work together with that senior pastor. And I think I can be a pretty good associate pastor. 
you know, because I want the gospel to be successful. I want people to be saved. That's why I became a pastor in the first place is because I thought this is the best way I, and I do mean me, to make disciples of all nations is by me being a pastor, not saying it for everybody, not everybody's calling, but I thought it was mine. And so then I received the call in 2005 to be the associate pastor at uh, Trinity Lutheran Church in Paso Robles, California. I still catch myself trying to say Trinity and I have to go, no, 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 King of Glory, King of Glory, King of Glory. Yeah, and then I have old notes that say Trinity on it instead of King of Glory. So I try to look for that. All right, so I came to Trinity Lutheran Church in Paso Robles, California, just all on fire, you know, because here I was going to be working with a staff. There was a school. Uh, there was a senior pastor who was experienced. And I thought, all right, here I've got partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there were a few things that took me a while to learn. You know, some of it was right off the bat. Uh, one of the things I learned right off the bat in the first several months there was uh, the, the, the staff, the partners in the gospel are by addition, and the problems are by multiplication. And so there were these huge problems, uh, and I just went into it thinking, hey, these are to be partners in the gospel. And so I went in there like a bull in a china shop saying, hey, let's partner in the gospel together, and let's do this. Let's work together. And instead, what I was doing was being a bull in a china shop, and I'm going, why are we in a china shop? I thought this was a church, and I thought we were partnering in the gospel. And so I didn't do the one thing that would have been so helpful and so important, which was go in there calmly and listen and find out from the people, why are you here? Why has God called you to be here? You know, and if I'd worked with a staff and, and instead of just listening to what I was told uh, and, and said, hey, here's what we want you to do, uh, I should have listened and said, well, what is God calling you to do? Not what are you calling me to do? Which led to the second thing that I was very important that I learned. So they, they called me with basically five areas of responsibility. I can't remember what they all were now. Uh, but I thought, okay, that's a lot. You know, five areas of responsibility, that's a lot. Well, it turned out to be five full-time jobs, which I can barely handle one full-time job. I cannot possibly mentally or physically do five full-time jobs. It's just not possible. And, and so what took me even longer finally to figure out, uh, and I didn't learn this until a few years ago, was that what they called me to do, what they asked me to do were things that they wanted done by someone else. So they said, Steve, we want you to do this, but we're not going to help you. Steve, we want you to do this, but we're not going to help you. It was in words, they would say, we want this done. We want this to be as a, done as a church, but we want you to do it. And the finger was pointed directly at me. It took me a long time to figure that out. Because again, I would go gangbusters when people said, hey, Steve, do this. And I'd go, all right, let's do this. And then I would look back and go, um, who's with me? And I'd realize I was all by myself. Uh, my kind of my, you know, I don't know if this is by nature or by training, but maybe it's both. You know, if you think of the church as a bus, I kind of yell at everybody and say, hey, everybody in the bus, out of the bus or out of the way. And then I get in the bus, get in the driver's seat, turn on the engine, put it in gear and go because God called us to go. You said go, so I'm going. And then I drive for a little while and then go. And I look back and see nobody was on the bus with me. And then in a trail behind the bus were a bunch of bodies laying there. And I go, how did this happen? And it's because I believed what people told me that I was supposed to do my job and do what they told me. And 
I forgot to listen, to listen to what they actually wanted to invest themselves in, what they actually wanted to do as the body of Christ, you know, to focus on the leadership and say, okay, how do I help you do what God called you to do, not what you think you called me to do, okay? And because here we're going to run into a problem as far as what's the pastor's job. All right, another bit of a, a learning lesson. Uh, we went through, I actually wrote this down. We went through, I think it was 15, in 16 years there, we went through 15 church growth or church health programs, okay? And I, I think I, I got rid of some of the books, uh, but I kept a few of them. Uh, but things like natural church development, which is totally awesome. It looks at your health and, you know, eight areas of health, and you kind of just work on one at a time, you know, the one that's really holding you back. Uh, and then you grow in health because there are kind of eight areas of health for a congregation. Uh, then we went through another called Growing an Engaged Church, uh, and it looks at kind of three areas uh, that you have as a church that you kind of need these three areas where if you do these three, then people will be engaged. They'll be, uh, they'll be enthusiastic. They'll, they'll buy into what you're, what you're doing, uh, and they'll be connected to God and connected to each other. And so we went through 15 different of these programs. And again, it took me a long time to figure out that I was told, hey, Steve, do this church health program, do this church growth program, you know, lead us. But all it was, was the church saying, we're going to continue to do the 50 things that put us off in all these different directions. But we want you to tack on one more thing. And what I thought was, oh, this is going to help focus all those 50 things we're doing into one thing that gives us direction and purpose and meaning and vision and clarity of where we're going. That's what I thought it was doing, but instead it was just one more thing tacked on, and it was, Steve, this is your responsibility all by yourself. And I'm going, wait a second, I can't do any of this by myself. And so this was why it was so thrilling. Uh, you know, after my senior pastor retired at the end of 2019, uh, they immediately called an intentional interim pastor to help them go through a process of self-discovery, a process of figuring out what it is that God has called them to do, how to focus people, how to engage them and connect them to God and connect them to each other. And after a month of that, uh, the, the interim pastor declined the call. And I was just being associate pastor, no senior pastor except Jesus. And then a month later, we had a leadership meeting. And they're kind of hemming and hawing. And I said, okay, look, if, if you want, if you want to lead the congregation through this process, I will help provide material for you. Because we had really talented people in our congregation, just like in this congregation. You know, so in my previous congregation, we had business owners, we had lawyers, we had business owners, we had, you know, educated people, accomplished people, uh, talented people. I'm going, you people are talented. And so I said, okay, if you're willing to lead a group, you know, kind of cottage meeting types groups, you know, self-discovery groups. Uh, and so we had 20 people at this meeting, seven people signed up. Now, if we were doing democracy, it would be majority rules and we would have done nothing, which is why I really dislike democracy. I really dislike majority rule. And I prefer something more along the lines of, you know, Holy Spirit rule where the Holy Spirit speaks and he says, hey, those people, those people are mine, get going and do it. And so I looked, do I go with the seven or do I go with the majority? How can I deny seven people who are willing to lead and go where the Holy Spirit is leading? And I'll tell you, one of the highlights of my life, and you might think this is kind of sad, but we were between services, between services, uh, you know, I'm all by myself as associate pastor. And this is the first time where I think I felt like I wasn't all by myself. 
the deaconess and I were in the fellowship hall, standing there waiting, while 40 people were at separate tables going through the word of God, seeking God's will, seeking God's direction for our church. And the deaconess and I were just standing there doing nothing but waiting for the latecomers. And then when they would come, we would go sit at a table and go through the, the Bible study and the seeking God's will uh, with, with the latecomers. That was so awesome. It was the highlight of my life. We had like 40 people in Bible study between services. I, it was the best ministry of my life. Of course, the lockdown then hit and I'm going, what are you doing, Lord? Uh, that was brutally difficult. My, my health is still not recovered from the stress of that. But even so, it was just a glorious experience, which makes me then ask the question, why did I accept the call of the King of Glory Lutheran Church when things were so good? Again, I had a routine. I, I had a, a, a much higher salary there. Uh, you know, we had a, a nice home. We lived in a nice community. Uh, the church was going, I thought, in a good direction. So, why did I accept the call to King of Glory Lutheran Church when I hate moving? Did I mention I hate moving? I hate moving. Okay. So if you want me to stick around, you can know I hate moving, but I go where God tells me to go. So what were the factors in my decision? And there are three factors that uh, basically every pastor needs to look at when, when uh, considering a call, because I basically had three calls at that juncture. Uh, I had the call to be the associate pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church and Pastor Robles, so I had to consider that call. Have I fulfilled my ministry to the people of Trinity Lutheran Church and school? Have I fulfilled my ministry to Pastor Robles? Okay, because I can't leave that call unless I fulfilled my ministry. Then I have the call to King of Glory Lutheran Church, up here in the great Pacific Northwest and ask, have to ask the question, is God calling me to serve there? And then number three, I have to consider my call to my family. Uh, uh, you know, there are various, there are health factors, there are being able to provide for my family factors, there was my son's schooling, uh, there's my son, my wife's and my, and my son's mental and spiritual and relational well-being, uh, all of that has to be factored in to the equation. So why did I accept the call here? Hmm. So as far as my family, uh, they seemed acceptable and amenable, and certainly a uh, running start has been good for my son here. Uh, we were looking forward to that. Uh, it is a, I think, a slightly better situation than what we had uh, with the community college in Paso Robles, which was really good. It was really a really good situation, I thought, uh, the community college there. Uh, and the potential to go to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where Monica and I went. Yeah, we were looking forward to that. So as far as family goes, we thought, okay, God's always provided for us. We can do this if that's where God takes us. So then as far as the Trinity Lutheran Church goes, you know, again, things were going so well there. And I was so wanting to keep going and see where God was going to take the church. And I was seeing God do such good things. So a couple factors. Uh, one was the senior pastor who had been there for uh, a long time. Uh, 20, over 20 years he had been there. And then I had been there for 16 years. So that's a long time, uh, which that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. For me, I was going, this is a good thing. I'm finally getting settled down. So the senior pastor retiring after a long time kind of gives us a clean slate to restart. Then they were calling a, an intentional interim pastor. And so my question was, am I going to be an aid and support to this intentional interim pastor, or am I going to be a hindrance to this intentional interim pastor? And so weighing that was 
really difficult because I really wanted to see this through. And I really wanted to work with this intentional interim pastor. I wanted to partner with him. I wanted to see what we could do together and what I could do to support him and to see God work through this process with somebody who had been through this process before of self-discovery. And what I was gathering from prayer and from, you know, talking with my district president was, hey, you know what? you've been here a long time, senior pastor was here for a long time, maybe the church needs a new start, maybe the church needs a fresh start, maybe I'll be baggage, you know, just my mere presence uh, will bring all that 16 years, something that we could leave in the past if I were gone, and the congregation doesn't need to bring that into the future whatever growth I've had, remember I came there like a ball of fire, like a bull in a china shop, and some people have really long memories. It doesn't matter how good of a person I was at that juncture. Some people will only remember what I'd done 16 years ago when I was still very young and very stupid. Which then leads me to the call to this congregation, which is just because God may have been saying, okay, Steve, you're done here doesn't mean that I would go to King of Glory. And so looking at, you, at your congregation, looking at King of Glory, I looked and thought, oh, I'm looking for a new start. Apparently, God wants me to have a new start. And Trinity in Pastor Robles is looking for a new start with their intentional interim pastor. And what I got from the interview with King of Glory, uh, you had been uh, vacant. Yeah, you had not had a called pastor for two years. Uh, that's generally called vacant. You know, not having a called pastor. Uh, but you were you were ably served, and uh, from what I heard, you know, things were things were good uh, during this this two year period. And you were all, all looking for a fresh start. There were, I think there were like 25 interview questions when I went through the interview. And I said, that's a lot of questions. And I felt bad for saying it because all the work that had been put into those 25 questions. And I go, but it's okay. My question's the same for all of them. My answer is the same to all of them. And it was basically this. If it's important to you, it's important to me. And I got to say, when you say something's important to you, I, I mean, in the sense of, if you say diet and exercise are important to you, but you eat nothing but cookies and ice cream and sit around in your recliner all day, then I'm going to say diet and exercise are not important to you. So if you say something is important to you and you're willing to invest yourself in it, then I'll be right there with you. And the sense that I got in accepting this call was you needed a fresh start. You were looking for someone to help guide you and lead you in the direction God was wanting to take you. And you kind of needed that, you know, someone with experience, uh, you know, a pastor to kind of help lead you in going the direction God was calling you to go. And so you can say fresh start, fresh start, fresh start, but it's a fresh start in the sense of going in the direction God is leading us, going in the direction God is taking us. And so I accepted the call to be the pastor here. And as I do so, I, I need to emphasize this. And, and I apologize for putting this in such stark black and white colors. But I have to do this to exaggerate, to make a point. King of Glory Lutheran Church is not my church. That is, I'm not here to impose my agenda. I'm not here to say, well, this is the way I've always done things, so this is how we're going to do them now. Yes, certainly there are things that I will not uh, give in on. You know, if you want to throw out the Bible, you know, throw out the Word of God, I'm not going to do that, you know. Uh, if you if God calls you to certain certain types of ministry, there are things that I just don't feel equipped or able to do, to which I'll say, hey, that's great. You've discovered what God wants you to do. Now you need to find a pastor who can lead you to do that. But my expectation is God brought me here to help you, help you, because this is your church. I, I kind of need to say this is Jesus's church. 
and Jesus has entrusted it to you. I'm here to help you do God's will. You're not here to help me do God's will. Okay, I, I hope that's clear, and I hope everyone would agree with that. This is your church. It's not Steve Wilweber's church. It's me here to help you do what God called you to do, right? I mean, we've got to be in agreement on that, right? Okay, uh, that doesn't mean I'm not leading. Uh, it's that I'm leading you to do what God called you to do, right? And so that's where we need to discover how it is that God has shaped us through our experiences, through our spiritual growth, uh, through our experiences with the Holy Spirit working in our lives, our experience in growing in God's word, our experience in serving one another. Uh, what is it that helps connect us to God, to each other? What is it that's in our community where the gospel is desperately needed? And so we want to bring all these things together all these things that are kind of just splattered all over the place and see where there's the overlap between our people and God and the people around us and go, this is the unique calling of King of Glory Lutheran Church. Okay, are you with me? So I hope that explains why I did accept the call here and why I'm so thrilled with this process that we're going through, right? All right, God's peace.